I was asked to speak to you today. I never had my voice this loud outside before. I was asked to speak to you today about the meaning of baptism. A short message on the meaning of baptism. So baptism is a symbol of a greater reality that we have with Christ. It's a symbol of our death, burial, and resurrection that we have when we're united with Christ. So when many of the people who are here are guests or new to Cornerstone, that you, that you would know when we do this ceremony, it's a, a ceremony that the Lord told us to do 2,000 years ago, and it's a ceremony where when the person is put in the water of baptism and they're raised out, it's a symbol of how they die when Christ died, they rose from when, when Christ rose, that in his death, in his resurrection, we have hope of eternal life. It's a symbol, and not an actual, but a symbol of how our sins are washed away, in what Christ has done for us. If you remember back in Acts chapter 2, there's a command from Peter. And Peter, in a sermon, he says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Remember this sermon with me. In Acts chapter 2, it was a time of Pentecost, and Jerusalem was filled with many people from every different place around the Mediterranean. All sorts of tongues, all sorts of different languages, all sorts of different sorts of people. And they're there intermingling like we are here. And at that time, a, an important event happens. It's an event in history that is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he comes at Pentecost. That coming is not like a repeatable event, but it's a, it's a one-time event like when Christ was crucified, that one event in history and how it has an impact, so the coming of the Holy Spirit is a one-time event there at Pentecost. And when that happens, the people begin to, to speak in all sorts of different languages to the crowd who has all different sorts of languages. And they begin to speak to them about the gospel, about the wonderful works of God. And as they do that, Peter says, sees an opportunity. And in Acts chapter 2, he begins to preach. He preaches a sermon. And the sermon has three things to it. The sermon is bold, the sermon is biblical, and the sermon is Christ-centered. Bold, biblical, and Christ-centered. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it says, He takes his stand with the eleven. So with a great crowd of people, Peter takes his stand it's a bold sermon, because this sermon is going to be contrary to how the people think about religion. The same city had crucified the Lord just a couple of months ago, and here he is to preach to them about the risen Lord. And he takes his stand in this bold sermon, and he begins to point to the scripture, and he takes them to the apostle Joel. And he says, do you see all of these languages that are happening? Do you see all this work that's happening? That is a biblical event. So he was bold. He was biblical. And he points to Joel, and Joel has a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. The near fulfillment is happening in their midst, and the far fulfillment will happen at the Lord's return. So after Peter, he stands, takes a bold stand, he takes a biblical position, he begins to explain more of that Bible in his Christ-centered sermon. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, he begins to apply the sermon home with the people. And he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to, by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Peter goes right for the point. He says, this Christ, this Christ, who you know was real, you know by the signs that he did, 
he was a the genuine Messiah. And many people today, many of you are here, and you know Christ is real. You know that the Bible is true. You know that what it, Christ has to say about you should be respected, it should be listened to, and should be followed. Just like they knew when Christ spoke that he was a genuine man of God, that he was the Messiah, and yet they crucified him. In the same way, consider your life. Consider your life and how you've treated Christ. You may have heard about him, but, and you may have thought about him in, a, in some sort of respectable sense. But when you look at your best deeds, they are filthy rags, just in how you look at how you've treated Christ. Think about when you read the Bible. If you read the Bible, when you read the Bible, as a lost person, as a false Christian, we read the Bible for ourselves so that we can show how much we know. We read the Bible to earn our way to heaven. That's a lie. That's a lie. You cannot earn your way to heaven by any good work that you do, not by any baptism, not by any reading of the Scripture. And we use Christ's name habitually, repeatedly, to try and establish our own righteousness. It never ceases to amaze me how many people know the phrase, oh, we're not saved by works. And then you ask them, why do you think God would let you into heaven? And they say, well, I have a good heart. Or, well, by the way I've lived my life. And yet, out of the same mouth, they say, well, I know you're not saved by works. And yet, they genuinely believe in their hearts Many of us, almost all of us at one point, genuinely believed that we were good in God's eyes. And many of us would have said as well, well, you can't be saved by works. Well, how are you going to get to heaven? Well, I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to obey the commands of Christ. Think with me that how desperately you need Christ to save you just in how you've treated Christ. The people here in Acts 2 had treated Christ with contempt. You have treated Christ with the same contempt. And it's shown in your religious works and how you do them. You do them for yourself. Every one of us is born this way. But Peter continues to explain that this Christ whom you've put to death God has raised up, and he loosed the pains of death. And P Peter goes on to explain about how this was a prophecy by David, that Christ would rise from the dead. And he says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you in verse 29 of Acts chapter 2. He says, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn by an oath to him, that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. And he's saying, this prophecy is not about David. David spoke it, but this prophecy is about how Christ would be rise from the dead. How Christ is the one who is the fulfillment. And he goes on to explain that this God, Jesus, God has raised up, in verse 32, of which we're all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured this, which you now see and hear. For David did not to ascend into the heavens, but he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in my right hand till I made your enemies your footstool. David quotes this, and he says, the Lord said to my Lord. David says, The Lord in heaven said to my Lord. And everyone in this crowd, everyone in this Jewish crowd would know this is a messianic prophecy. The, the Messiah was to be the son of David. If David says, The Lord in heaven says to my Lord, who is going to be my descendant, how can the descendant of David be David's Lord? He must be the Messiah. He must be God in the flesh. 
And so Peter quotes this prophecy to declare that Jesus is God. Jesus is the one who is attested by signs and wonders. Jesus is the one who was raised from the dead. And we celebrate his resurrection this day. And then he brings this message home with the people once again about how they have treated Christ. And so I ask you once again, think about how you have treated Christ. Do you say you love him with your mouth and then with your life you treat him with contempt? Do you say I love Christ and I know adultery is wrong, but then you lust in your heart? You say, I love Christ, but you worship yourself, your fame, your name, your reputation. You say, I love Christ, but you do religious works for yourself. And then when bad things happen in your life, you blame this God. And you say, look at all the good that I've done. How could God treat me this way? How could I be hurt in this way? And you don't see. You don't see that all of those hurts have been to bring you to the Lord in his kindness to call you to repentance. So Peter's sermon is bold. It is biblical. And it's Christ-centered. You're going to hear testimonies about how people have understood who Christ really is. And how did they respond? They responded the same way Peter calls the people to respond here. In verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says to them, Repent. Turn from this lifestyle of self-righteousness. Turn from the way that you've treated Christ with contempt. Turn. Admit in your mind, admit down to the center of your being that you have treated God horribly. He has not treated you horribly. You have treated Him horribly. And He has been so merciful to save you. Those who were crucified the Lord, many of them Christ saved in this day here at Pentecost. And many of you who treated Christ with contempt, He saved you. And He saves you through genuine faith, through genuine repentance. And Peter calls the people here to repent and let every one of you be baptized. There are many wrong views about baptism if you go around and ask people. If you go to some churches down the road, you will see baptism of children ages 5, 6, 7, and 8. And you ask the children, do you understand, the, and ask them do they, if they understand the gospel. Many of you have been baptized when you were a similar age, when you did not know the gospel, when you did not know your own sin, when you did not understand the work of Christ, when you did not understand the essential things to be a Christian. And yet how many children are baptized in that same sense, making a lie of conversion. How many of the one billion Catholics in the world have been baptized as babies, thinking that it washes away original sin? And it makes a, a mockery of baptism. And it points to a symbol as though it was the Savior. No one gets a single sin washed away today in that lake. Not a single sin. It doesn't wash away one. Do not believe the lie. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that have somehow thought that, that their baptism, whether as a baby or as an adult, that they're depending on that act to get them into heaven. There couldn't be anything further from the truth. Instead, it is not the Savior, but it is a symbol. It is a symbol of what the Savior has done. Do not mix the truth too. It can become damning. The reason why Peter 
mentions them together here now is because he's describing conversion. He's describing conversion as a whole. Just like if you were to say to a couple, okay, um, a couple that wants to get married, okay, you need to go make your vows, get your rings, and get to the church. If you say to that couple, go make your vows, get your rings, go to the church, getting your rings doesn't get them married. Getting to the church doesn't get them married. But their vows before God and before the witnesses, that's where the marriage takes place. In the same way, Peter is describing the experience of conversion here. This symbol. Just in the same way if, if I were to say, the pen is mightier than the sword. Am I talking about actual pens and actual swords? No, I'm talking about what the written literature stands for and what a sword stands for with war. In the same way, when, Christ, when Peter is commanding people to be baptized here, he's speaking of the, what the impact of that symbol. That they're to be baptized because their sins have been forgiven. They're to be baptized because of this reality. This is a great symbol of a great reality that Christ saves sinners. Christ saves sinners. And we are a sinful people. And we need a Savior. Listen now with these testimonies and examine your heart. Hear them as, as they talk about their Savior, how they were when they were lost, how they heard the gospel, and how Christ changed their lives. And know that the symbol here, that we, when we go to the lake, it's a symbol of what Christ has done in His work on the cross. It is a symbol of His death, His burial, and His resurrection when the person enters the water of baptism. And give Christ the glory for the work that He has done. So I say to you, I say to you all, God commands you to repent and believe in the gospel. And then, because of what Christ has done, the forgiveness of sins, be baptized. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the privilege of uh, sharing with you, um, to tell you about my second birth. Um, I had nothing to do with my first birth, and I had nothing to do with my second birth. I thank God for that second birth. That's why I'm here today to share with you the good news of um, what Christ did in my heart. I was brought up in church. My mom went back to church. I was 10 years old. And um, I was overwhelmed by what I was listening to for the first time. I had never heard um, the word being preached um, uh, that way. And um, growing up, I came through the years. I, I, I've seen, I had seen a lot of, uh, heard a lot of testimonies and see a lot of lives changed. And um, some of them just, um, I was overwhelmed by, by the change because I, I saw some of them uh, in their old life and I saw them in their new, their new life. And uh, I knew, I had a sense that there must be a God. And um, I grew up thinking, well, um, it, was, it was a combination of things that, that would always go through my mind. As a young person, you know, you struggle with uh, what do you believe, how do you believe it, and even who you are. And at times I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm cool, I'm good, because uh, I don't do the real bad stuff, you know. So I'm good, I'm all right, you know. And there were other times where I felt like I needed to help God and go get dirty and go to have a testimony. I thought I had to help God with my testimony so I could have a good testimony, the big testimony, so people could see, wow, there really is a God, you know. And there was one day where I, um, I got home uh, from school. I was um, really super really low and really depressed. Um, my goal was to, to turn 16 and quit school because I hated school so much. Struggled with reading and writing and I just couldn't wait to turn 16 and, and quit. I had a plan. I, I, was, I thought I was going to turn 16 and just go get dirty, go to the dumps, then have a testimony. I thought I, to the extent where I thought I had to go do the real bad stuff, quote unquote. And then one day when I um, went into my room, it was really a small bedroom. It was almost like the size of a closet. It only fit a twin bed and a, a nightstand. And um, I knew what hunger was. We, I grew up poor. 
and um, I was ready to to wait as long as it took. And I, I prayed out there, I cried out to God. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here until you show up. And there are times where I, I want to believe you're real, and there are times where I, I truly doubt that you are. So if you are real, show up. Come and show me yourself. And I was willing to stay in that room until he did. And um, it wasn't too shortly after that that he did show up to the point where he showed me my condition before him. I saw my sin. I felt my sin. I had a sense of his holiness, and I felt so filthy and dirty. There's a kid in church that never went out and did mess around and done, right? But he showed me my condition. It's like the Holy Spirit reminded me the word that said, if you commit one, like you're guilty of them all. And that kept kept um, coming up, and, and it was so clear to me. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty as everybody else that I consider to be worse than me. And all I could do at that moment was repent. I broke down and cried. And I, was so, I felt such, so, so much shame for my sin and the fact that I even thought those words, the fact that I even challenged him. And I had a sense of, at that moment of forgiveness. I had a taste of grace and mercy over me to the point where all I could do was thank him then. For my, my prayer changed from repentance and brokenness to a, just a grateful heart. And I, I, I'll never forget that day. I was only 16 years old, but I know that I know that, that it was real this time because I knew that I wasn't going to be perfect, and I knew that he was going to hold on to me. My prayer was, Lord, till the day you come or till the day I die, I want to serve you with all my heart, soul, and strength. And I know that it was God that brought me into that room that day to show me my condition before him. And I'm so grateful that I know I didn't deserve it. And yet, um, he did that for me, called me in my room, and I went looking for my dad in Puerto Rico, not shortly after that. I didn't know my dad. I grew up without a dad. And again, I had a sense of, um, I had to forgive my dad the way God forgave me, that he forgave me first. And uh, whatever thoughts, whatever um, I had in my heart for my dad, it just went away, and, and, and I went looking for my dad. I thank God that I, 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 I was obedient to that. And again, he gave me the strength to do so. And um, again, thank you for this opportunity. And I, I'm, I'm just, I just worship the Lord, and I thank um, him for calling me, saving me, rescuing me, and looking at me now as if I were, as if I were Jesus or Christ, knowing that um, I got a long way to go, got a long way to go, but I thank him that he continues to teach me and grow me, and I'm sorry if I took more than my three minutes. <laughs> Be blessed. Blessings on all today. Um, this has been an incredible experience um, attending Cornerstone. Uh, we've been coming since October, and um, I just can't tell you how overwhelmed George and I have been with the love, and just, um, I feel like I know a lot of you for years, and it's, it's just been an awesome experience here. I had to write mine down because um, as a child, I stuttered, and when I get nervous, I start to stutter, so <laughs> I figured, let me write this down. Um, I was brought up in what was supposed to be a Christian home. My dad rarely attended church, and my mom was the one that brought all five of us to church. Christianity was not clear, nor was it biblical. But since my mom did bring us to church, and since God's word does not come back void, I would feel convicted at Sunday school and um, during services. There was one evening, though, when the minister was preaching, and was talking, if we were to die, where would you go? I was not able to answer that question. As he proceeded to explain, I realized how sinful I was and that I needed to repent and turn to Jesus. For me, attending church was an escape from my home life, but I was truly lost and also suffered from severe depression. Many times in my depression, I had the urge to run away from home. But all that changed when I repented and turned to Christ. My longing became knowing Jesus more. I was baptized a few months later, and through the years, in my youth, and now as an adult, God continues to refine me. Though I have challenges, sanctification is a wonderful journey, trusting God each day. And um, there's something that I want to do um, that God impressed in my heart today. Um, um, George and I were having difficulty because George had the truth and I wanted to continue going 
to a charismatic church or I just wanted something else. And um, I just thank God for George's faithfulness. He never gave up on me. God never gave up on me. And though I have repented, I still want to say I'm sorry to George for the hard time that I gave him. But um, uh, it was the Lord really impressed it in my heart during service today that I needed to do this in front of you all because I truly gave George a hard time. I really thought he was losing his mind. And um, my life has been changed. I, I am not the same person. Um, and I just thank God for, for, for George's faithfulness. And I, just the way he leads me, um, the way he um, serves the Lord, I just, I just automatically, you know, listen, submit gladly. And um, I just felt like I had, I had to share that today. Thank you. CBC, how are we doing today? All right. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Augustine Estrella. All right, I've been coming to Cornerstone for about uh, four years in July. All right, um, let me give you a quick little background. Um, I grew up. Um, stop, Mike. <laughs> uh, I grew up. Um, I grew up going to church. You know, I went to church as a little kid. Um, just we went to church. You know, um, nothing serious. I didn't know God. Um, when I got older, you know, um, I was a problematic child. You know, um, did a lot of dumb things, um, and you know, um, you know, we went uh, went to church. I um, I would say God started drawing me. You know, drawing me, not 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 converted, but he started drawing me. He started um, opening my eyes to see Jesus, um, to see him, like, around the age of 16. That's when I, like, realized, okay, there is a God, and um, there is a God, okay? And um, and it came about through a, a, a bad circumstance. I had a, a good friend of mine who passed away at 16, so I went to church with my brother, and they were having... Um, they were having um, a play on hell, and um, I was sad about that, my friend, and then I realized, man, I don't want to go to hell, you know, and so, um, and so, there we go, and so, um, you know, like the, like the, the four soils, you know, you hear part of the truth, because they were in speaking the whole truth, there was part of the truth in that sermon or in that play, what they were saying, which kind of sprouted up, you know, and you got that um, happy joy, joy Christian who, um, well, but professor, should I say, that uh, professes, you know, to know Christ. They, um, they're happy and they go about thinking that they're, um, they're a believer. And then when times of times of trials and tribulations come, they wither away. All right, and um, that was my life, all my life, you know, through bad circumstances happening in my life. I um, I come to the Lord, you know, then um, when everything's fine and dandy, you know, times of trials and tribulations comes, I shrink back from the Lord, you know, and um, and in that, the Lord revealed my heart how I was a lover of self, you know, and so there's a lot to say, but I'm just going to try to, um, uh, so, Okay, sorry guys, bear with me. Um, Cornerstone, okay? Came to Cornerstone about four years ago, just about. And um, I came on a Sunday, went to Emmanuel's house, hung out with the brothers, and I was like, man, I love this church, All right? Um, I went to a Tuesday group, hung out with Mr. Matugi, and we were going through Saving Faith. And in that book, um, was the first time that I knew why Jesus came. And it was, um, you shall name his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And I was like, man, I read that like a thousand times, and I never saw it, you know? And so I knew he came to save people for his sins, so that stuck with me, 
you know, I came, I continued to go into Cornerstone, but again, you know, I shrunk back, shrunk back, shrunk back. Um, I professed to know God, but in my, in my works, I denied, I denied him, denied his power, something like that, right? And then, so, time went on, okay, I'm gonna make it quick, guys, right? Time went on, and, um, I just, I was in sin, you know, and, um, let me tell you, the brothers, the leaders here were beyond gentle with me, you know, um, lovingly, patiently, um, calling me to repentance, calling me to, um, to, to majesty. Okay, so, okay. Um, they, um, <laughs> um, there got to a point that I just stopped coming to church, you know. I said, forget it, you know what, I'm not going to come to church no more. Um, I can't do it. Um, and uh, the truth of the matter was, is I did not know God, you know. And so, lovingly, a brother came, my boy Izzy Capo, right there. Um, he came to my house. And he said, hey, bro, I just want to talk to you. You know what? I don't even want to talk. You just talk to me. You know, I want to listen. And so, um, you know, I was like, no, nah, I don't really want to talk. And um, so we started talking. And then we talked. And he, um, he told me a little story, something that um, happened to a brother and a sister here in this church that happened to um, a loved one of theirs. And um, that story stuck out to me. And I was like, wow, man, I don't want to die like that, you know. So... In that conversation, in my brother coming to me, which I believe the Lord sent him to me, you know, uh, prior to that, uh, I got angry with God, you know, because I, I, you know, I was it's like um, just going through the motions and I'm like, man, dude, you know, I can't live my life like this. I can't live my life. You know, I know I can't live my life like this. And I got mad with God saying, God, I didn't even ask to be born. You know, I didn't even ask to be here. Why do it's not fair that I got to suffer because I didn't even ask to be on this earth, you know. And so, um. So, then he comes along, so this is, you know, this is the timeline, he comes along, and he talks to me, you know, and then in that conversation, after that conversation, God just gave me a desire to, to just start seeking him, right, so I started um, listening to sermons, alright, and I heard a, storm, a sermon on apostasy, alright, that sermon scared the daylights at me, I was at work, and I was listening to the sermon, and I was just sick to my stomach, I wanted to go home and die, and I was like, man, I'm an apostate. I'm done. This is, this is not good, right? And so um, then I just started listening to sermons, okay? And so I'm going to sum it up. Sorry. Okay. In this, in this, um, the sermon got scared. So I started searching through scriptures, you know? And so I was listening to Psalm 78, all right? And in Psalm 78, there's a guy named Ash, and he's talking and he says this, Psalm 78, 13. This is what stood out to me, all right? He says, um, he says, And he divided the seas and caused them to pass through. And he made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime also he led them. In the daytime he also led them with the cloud and all the night with the light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness. He gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. But they sinned even more. You know, I wasn't there in the wilderness, but in my life, you know, God, God has shown himself to be real, you know. And just, man, if I tell you the story, you'd be like, wow. All right, so, and it says, but they sinned even more against him. By rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness, and they tested God in their hearts by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, He struck the rock so that the waters gushed out. Fast forward, okay? Um, and then it says, um, Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire. By the way, I always thought that God was mad at me when I sinned, and so therefore He didn't want to be—He didn't want to look at me. You know, I had a mis a misview of God. And then uh, because they didn't, and it says, so a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in His salvation. And that was the root of it all: unbelief. 
That was the root of it all. And that's when I said, Lord, I am Israel. I don't believe in your power to save me. Um, I don't believe that your power is more powerful than my sin. And um, it was like a light bulb went off. Like, Lord, you are more powerful than my sin. You are. You can save me, you know. And then going through and like listening to the sermons in Isaiah where it says that if you would just turn to me, I will forgive you of all your sins. All of them. Every single one of them. And I didn't, I believed them. It's like a light bulb went off and I believed them. And then, um, and then I think I guess that's how it all started, man. That's how it just went on, you know. And I've been coming here and um, I believe the Lord changed my heart. You know, I love the Lord. I want to serve the Lord with you guys, with my church. This is my church. You guys are my people, CBC for life. Um, <laughs> and, um. Uh, Sorry for taking up all your time, but that's it, you know. Um, if there's more, I mean, there's more of you guys, like, you know, if anybody's interested, you know, I'll be willing to talk to you aside. <laughs> we get more in depth and we'll talk about it, you know. Um, but I believe that um, the Lord really changed my heart and he changed this um, heart of stone into a heart of flesh and caused me to, um, to obey his commands and that he will persevere me to the end. All right? Peace. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Vicky Murtis and... I've been going to Cornerstone for about two years. Um, my brother Sadrach invited me. That's why he's standing next to me. I'm nervous. Um, I grew up in a Haitian home where we were taught to love God, but not so much love his commandments. We love you, sister. Love I grew up in a, uh, in a church, in a Haitian home, where I was taught to love God, growing up in a tradition, um, um, essentially every day. Uh, the church I used to attend was a Pentecostal church, where uh, you would come to display um, your looks and your popularity. On Sunday, um, you would look holy, but on Monday through Friday, you were disobedient to God. I got baptized at the age of 15. But from that point on, I lived my life as a liar, a thief, an idolater, a sexual moral person, as 1 Corinthians spoke of. I was, very, um, I was a very moral person, but in God's eyes, I was his enemy. I was always angry, and I was always ready to curse someone out. I hanged out around a lot of people who didn't care about me, and I put myself in situations where I could easily be killed. Um, I did a lot of dirty work in secret, but I was never caught. Deep in my heart, I was saved. Because I got baptized, no matter how many times I sinned, all I had to do was ask for forgiveness and I would be okay. There was neither no repentance or sorrow over my sin. But one day my brother came over my house to tell me about the church he found and how he's been living, um, how he's been living um, a, cl a completely different life and how we've been against the Bible. He continued to evangelize to me to the point where I was, his words began to be offensive. I started to distance myself from him, and I didn't, I didn't want to hear him talk any much about the grace of God and how his life was changed. In 2012, I was in a car accident um, that really hurt me, and I was overflowed with tears. Um, the people thought I was crying because I was hurt, but at that moment, I realized if I would have died, I would have went to hell. I fell into a deep depression and loneliness. My old church family didn't have any concern for me if I was alive or if I was dead. I became very bitter and angry just thinking about all the good works that I did in the glory of men but not in Christ. I finally decided I would visit Cornerstone because my brother wouldn't stop talking about me, was talking about it. So I came to visit. After I visited, I didn't like it. My reasons were the people were too friendly and they asked too much questions. And the preacher um, preached too long. And I remember getting more and more confused and found myself thinking about how I was a hypocrite. I hated myself but still remained to show anger towards my old church for not pointing this out for me for 20 years. I've been there. But instead, I worried about... I'm sorry, 22 years. I've been there. But instead, um, I worried about coming back to church and I seen the work... That I, 
but all they worried about was me coming back to church so I can work with the youth. Months later, I decided not to go to church anymore. When my brother would ask me to come to church, I would have an excuse I can't, why I can't go. From the time of not going to church, my brother talk, kept talking to me about believing God and, it's, and how, he cha how God changed his heart. I started attending a small group from there. My eyes started to open and realize that I needed Christ and how sinful I was before him. I went to my old church leaders to ask him a question about these things and what I've been learning, and all he kept doing was shrugging his shoulders. So eventually he told me to So eventually he told me to leave. I was crushed and surprised that a person I saw as my shepherd would let his sheep go astray. All the while God had a plan and I just didn't know what it was. I continue to come to Cornerstone from all the biblical teaching and encouragement from the body. My desires and thoughts and visions and dreams and life and heart started to change through Christ. I started to put my trust and faith in Christ and Him alone. I don't know when exactly I got saved, but all I know, it, wasn't, it was the grace of God. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here, surrounded by faithful, um, God-seeking people that love the Lord and care for my soul. I thank God for placing me in a biblical church. I praise God every day for the mercy He has shown me. And I pray that I can be a good example to Sabrina that God has blessed me when I was 18. My life has shown nothing but growth, and I praise God every moment I am alive to spend it with faithful servants. Uh, good afternoon. How you doing? Um, good to be here. Good to listen to all the testimonies that God's been working on. And everybody here um, that are standing here, and many of you also. Um, I want to start by saying that my name is Vasco. I'm 33 years old, and I grew up a Catholic, but I, I didn't know, um, I didn't want any to, uh, anything to do with God's will, nor didn't, uh, nor didn't understand what God's will was and purpose of life. My understanding was that God's, God is three persons. He created all things, predestined men to heaven or hell. I knew there was a God, but I didn't know him. In 2001, I remember having a conversation with someone who just mentioned me uh, the two commands. Um, you shall not have another God before me, and you shall not make yourself any carved images in the likeness of anything in heaven, uh, in heaven above, in the earth beneath, and in the water under the earth. And those two commandments just uh, caused me to realize that I had many, many idols besides the one that uh, you can easily understand that um, the Catholic Church teaches. So, due to that, I, the next day I remember calling my mom and I told her that I no longer wanted to be a Catholic because I had been deceived for so, for so long by traditions that I didn't understand. Yet, I didn't know God nor how much weight my sins carry. But I sure loved them because I didn't have any desire, direction, or zeal towards God's Word. After that, I kept living in my sin, hating, hating Him, and I can say taking advantage of God's grace with my lifestyle, which it let me start to start having a bitter taste of my own ways. At this point in my life, God had granted me a family that without realizing how careless I looked over them with my life, put them in dangerous situations. My wife and I were not married at that time, living in fornication. In 2010, I remember her hearing, I mean, um, praying with my kids, reading a kid's book of the Bible, just um, the kid's Bible story, intending for all to, to read it as a family and learn about it. But I didn't want to participate. We kept living in a sinful life, teaching our kids hypocrisy and mocking God by our lifestyle. Eventually, all this was bringing great shame on myself. But focusing more that I didn't want to lose my family. I wanted to change my ways, but I still decided all the wrong things. Proverbs 4:19 says, The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. One night, desperately for a change, I cried out to God to help me change my ways. I told him, I know you're real. I don't know how to do this, but I beg you that you help me. I don't know if you heard my supplications or somebody else's prayers. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, 
The Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. For your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, that he will not hear. Around that time, on March 2011, I have found a new place of work on the month, and on the month of July, Brother Augustine started working there. By God's grace, God sent Augustine to work right next to my working station. I introduced myself to him, and throughout the days, we engaged into conversations about God's word. God, in his mercy, used Augie to tell me the condition of my heart, how rebellious it is towards God's laws, that he knows it better than I do. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, uh, the Lord says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? says, I, the Lord, search the heart, test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit, to, to the fruit of his doings. There was a particular day that he spoke to me how I deserve God's wrath because of my sins, that I've broken all God's laws, and God, being a just judge, had prepared a place for the unrighteous. I guess there was an expression on my face that led him to plead with me not to harden my heart from these sins. He told me how God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and that really stood out to me. Um, I remember going home that, that day with great conviction on my sins. If, I can, if we can harden our heart, imagine God hardening your heart, you know. Uh, that, is, that is a scary thing, and I say it because it was, it was to me. We can harden our heart to his word all the time. And, and him taking that action, it just led me to think, um, not being able to sleep. I was going to go to hell if I was to die on, on that day in my spiritual state. Throughout time, Augustine preached to me the reason why Christ came to the world, why he was crucified, which is for our sins, for those who turn away from their sins by trusting in his finished work on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As time passed by, I started to have a desire to know more about Christ. I started listening to sermons from Cornerstone and many other pastors. Conviction came, came over me from different areas. John 16, 8 says, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. My thoughts, my desires, behavior, language were slowly but radically progressively changing. I started to feel disgust by lying ashamed of lusting at other women, admitting my wrongs, asking for forgiveness when I got angry at anyone, even when they, they didn't know it. I, hung, I started hung, hungering for God's word, prioritizing it above many other things. God has shown me to be more thankful and content with everything that he has given me and not given me. The work of Christ on the cross has broken me by showing the love for the Father, the Father to him, and the unconditional love to wicked sinners. Christ has given me the strength and boldness to preach his word, even to strangers, which that was a difficult thing for me, and I'm pretty sure for many of you. Teaching me to do it lovingly with compassion, pleading with others to consider his message of reconciliation. God is the only one that saves. There is nothing in this world that can save us. My infinite thanks and praise to God. I was made by and for him for his glory. He fulfills the meaning of life and having no other place to go. Whenever I grow weary, I want to throw in the towel. I, he, uh, he, uh, he reminds me that I have nowhere else to go. Um, everything else just will lead you to destruction. And I just want to serve him. I, I want to thank Cornerstone, pastors, the brothers who have encouraged me in different ways and I just want to keep serving here with you guys and and just praise God for that. Hello, um, my name is Brianna Feliciano and uh, I've always been that good kid who did what their family said. Uh, I was a man pleaser. 
The thing with me being a man pleaser was that I took all my emotions and my opinions and I hid them away where no one could see them. I externally followed a script that I thought was acceptable to others while on the inside I despised everyone and everything around me. Although I showed my hatred for God through my actions, I didn't think I hated him at the time, but I didn't also think I loved him. I barely even knew if there was a God, let alone the God of the Bible. Growing up, I attended both a Catholic and a Pentecostal church on a regular basis, depending on what family member I was with. And that skewed my ideology of God. On one hand, I saw the mindless rituals and empty works, while on the other hand, I saw a bunch of people jumping up and down doing really strange things. I was confused. I would think if these things are what God wants for worship, then he must be bipolar. I never bothered to read the Bible to find out. There were so many other great books to read besides a boring Bible. I, in short, I was lost, clueless, and going nowhere fast except help. The first time I heard the, the gospel was roughly three and a half, four years ago, in a car, leaving a bookstore, spending some quality time with my brother. Despite living so near to one another, I really took the time to be with him, but that day was different. I remember him going through the law with me and piling on the bricks real high. The more bricks he piled, the more the tears started coming, but I wasn't crying because I was soft or broken over my sin. I was crying tears of pure hatred. My brother caught me without a script. I had nothing to say, no lines to follow. I was cornered and I hated him for it. Not too long after, my father and stepmom, they came to Cornerstone and by God's grace, they were saved. And naturally, I didn't appreciate that miracle because now I was going in a church full of people I didn't have anything to say to. Um, I started reading my Bible, going evangelizing, morphing in order to act the right way, to say the right things, all along detesting everyone in the process. Little did I realize I was starting to understand sin more. Uh, I was starting to see hints and glimpses of the gospel, but I didn't react to it at all. And if anything, the knowledge that I was receiving was puffing me up, um, feeding my pride, making me more and more self-righteous. As someone who has never partook in any obvious displays of sin, I found myself judging others unrighteously at my school or evangelizing downtown. Uh, I hated the things I would witness, but not because it was an offense to God, but because it was dis distasteful to me. Last year, I saw my sin hurt a lot of people around me. Usually that would make me happy because I was very petty, but it pained me to see my family in pain. By the time summer came around, Every sermon, every evangelism conversation, every time I opened up the Bible, I could feel the hardness of my heart being chipped away. I could finally feel the weight of my sin. The notion of hell, judgment, and wrath got to me. They plagued me to the point where a good night's sleep was utterly impossible. It was by God's grace and mercy to break me in this time. He lowered me to my knees and had me crying out, pleading for him to pluck all my wickedness from my heart, to grant me the ability to repent from my sins and lead me to the cross. And in that time, by God's grace, I was saved. Um, since then, I've actually been able to love for a change, loving my family, my brothers and sisters, and above all, Christ. Instead of just seeing glimpses and hints of the gospel, this glorious picture was unraveled to me before my eyes, painting the wondrous work of the cross in fine detail. Although I battled with assurance a couple times in the last year, I just feel so blessed that the Lord would choose to give me a love for the scriptures, a love of the brethren, and a love for souls, and um, a love for Christ and a zeal to follow him and follow his commandments. I'm so thankful for my family for putting up with me. Uh, 
for the church leadership for being faithful in everything they've been doing and, and for God for blessing me with so much and showing me incredible mercy. Hi, I'm Catherine, and um, I grew up in a Christian home and was sent to a small private Christian school. And by the age of six, I said the sinner's prayer. I did everything that I knew I was supposed to do. I read my Bible, and I was baptized and was very involved in my church. However, all, I did all these things begrudgingly and not out of love for Christ. I was a whitewashed tomb. I looked good on the outside, but the reality of my heart was that of a disobedient, coveting, lying, thieving, blasphemous idolater. I was spiritually dead and heading to hell. In November 2010, I came down to visit Stephanie Jones. Um, during my visit to um, Cornerstone, one of the ladies went through the Beatitudes with me, and my eyes were open to the fact that I was not following God with all my heart, soul, and strength. I wasn't even trying to. I began to see myself as an enemy of God, deserving hell, and all, the, my, and all my good works were just filthy rags. There was nothing I could do to save myself from my, uh, from my eternal punishment. I have offended a holy and righteous God, and my heart was far removed from Him. The only hope I had was Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life that I could never live. He satisfied God's wrath by dying on the cross, and he took upon himself the sins of the world. He overcame death, proving once again he is God. And only turning from my sins and denying myself and following him wholeheartedly would make me right before God, who demands perfection. Through God's mercy and grace in the spring of 2011, God saved me. I, was no, long I no longer seek man's approval but God's. And any good that I do is built because of Christ. Before I've been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I grew up in a home where we went to church every Sunday and even went to church at school until the fourth grade. I was a part of missionettes at Children's Church. They told me how important it is to ask Jesus into your heart so that you could live for him. I can't count how many times I went to the altar and said the prayer to ask Jesus into my heart, and it never seemed to work. I continued on trying to uphold the values and morals that my parents taught me by not doing what typical teenagers did and was seen by my friends as the church girl. I did not see myself as needing a savior because I had much pride and self-righteousness using the standard of my unsafe friends and family. When I turned 18 and was about to head off to college, I decided I was an adult and could do whatever I wanted. I felt I deserved to have fun after being such a good daughter, friend, and student, but my parents were quick to let me know that I don't get a reward for good behavior. After that, I felt like, well, if my parents don't appreciate my goodness, I might as well live for myself. And that's what I did my first two years of college. I had a boyfriend, would party and drink, all still while believing I was a Christian and God would understand. I would pray almost every night to ease my guilty conscience, but it never worked. I knew God was angry and not pleased with me. Several times he put people in my life to call me to him, like my co-worker who would always invite me to church and Bible study. I would go, although I knew I was living for the Lord. I knew I was a hypocrite and that God would give me over to my sin, like it says in Romans 1.28, to a depraved mind and my life would forever be in the devil's hands. Out of this fear, I broke up with my boyfriend, lost several friends, and decided to dedicate my life to Christ my last two years of college. My life got better. I got invited to a college Christian group so that I could meet like-minded friends and went to church consistently again. I would thank God for my new life, yet started to miss my sin. I kept moving forward, graduated, and moved back home to Orlando and had spiritually plateaued. I met a friend named Scott who introduced me to the doctrines of grace and realized I had a very low view of God. I was invited to a women's group at Cornerstone by Kevin Scott who introduced me to Ty Burden then so we could carpool to a small group together. I noticed instantly that the women's group at Cornerstone was different than what I was used to in a great way. I had true motivation to read, understand, and apply biblical teaching and had true accountability. 
I eventually wanted to visit the church as well, and the preaching was very difficult to hear because it was preaching against sin, false professions, and that there is a choice to either turn or burn. I was thinking for myself, this is too harsh. I went home after church, actually read my Bible about the passage from the sermon. I Google searched turn or burn, and Charles Spurgeon came up. <laughs> I started reading his sermons and realized this pastor is preaching from the Bible and it's convicting me. This is what going to church is all about. It is not the pastor's opinions or ideas that convict people. It is the Bible that pierces the heart and makes one recognize our sin and our need for God. I also realized I wasn't truly converted but had a proud and self-righteous heart seeking man's approval before God and didn't love his commands. I saw myself in the mirror of God's perfect holy law and when held to his standard alone, I was a liar, a murderer, an adulterer at heart, blasphemer by calling myself a Christian while practicing sin, idolater by creating a God of my own imagination to justify my sin, and I'd broken God's laws repeatedly, intentionally, with no remorse. I was encouraged to read through the book of John by Anya Dempsey to study the life of Christ. I realized during a soteriology class that I needed to put all my faith, trust, and confidence in the righteousness of Christ and not my own. If you truly repent of your sin, God will faithfully impute you with the righteousness of Christ, and he will be a substitutionary atonement for your sin. God has humbled me tremendously through the preaching of his word, the love of the brethren that have had concern for my soul, my mind and my heart had been transformed to a desire to obey the will of God. You have to die to yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow Christ, or you are not worthy to be his disciple. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will only lift you up, as Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 says. I want to encourage you all today, here and now, to examine yourselves. Do not put your trust in traditions, formal prayers, good deeds, or moral reformity. It all leads to pride. You need a righteousness that is not your own. You don't know what tomorrow may bring. Our lives are nothing more than a morning fog, says James 4, 8. So today is the day to repent and believe the gospel. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, um, my name is Barbara Denise Jacaneta. Most, really, uh, most of you know me like Barbie. Um, I just want to say I uh, really thank the Lord for today's baptism. And I'm really grateful to be here. Um, John 16:33. I have said all these things to you. Sorry. John 16, 33, I have said all these things to you, that in me you might have peace, in the world you have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I've learned that the only way to overcome this world is Christ. Um, I was a girl that loved to party and to get drunk. I was an adulteress. I was a liar to the point that I believed my own lies. A thief, a shopaholic, in other words, covetous and prayful, one and two. Own the best brand clothes, Michael Kors bags, Dolce Gabbana, Jimmy Choo. Um, I wanted to be different than the average girl. My vocabulary w was spoiled with uh, coarse words. I was selfish. I saw my own gain. I lacked self-control. As a result, I re I'd suffer from an eating disorder. I, uh, I was prescribed antidepressants to fix my problem, which only made it worse. I have idols in my heart. I was obsessed on having a successful career and a lot of money. My desire was to become a remarkable federal agent for ICE, Investigations, Customs, Enforcement for Homeland Security, and travel with that job. I traveled to England and Wales to study abroad through UCF, and I was obsessed with moving there. Then I learned that God's will was for me to serve him here at Cornerstone. I started then working at Coles uh, with loss prevention. My supervisor was Lena Sierra. Um, she saw my struggle and a moment of frustration and tears. She shared the gospel with me. As she opened the word of God, I felt that God was talking to me in my trouble time. God's word, God's word became to my ears a soothing comfort because she showed me that it wasn't 
um, God's will for me to be miserable in this uh, sinful situation that I was in. I started crying with Lena. She then invited me to Cornerstone Baptist Church. <clears throat> Many invitations later, I finally decided to come. In November 2012 was when I first started coming, finally. However, after several months, I was still not had repented. I didn't fellowship and I didn't come to evening service. I only saw my self, uh, self gain. And what helped, me, uh, what helped me back from coming to church was my ex-boyfriend. Um, I was going to move in with him uh, in Texas, and I had no intention to marry him because of my sin and my um, idolatry and immorality. I was committed to him even though he was manipulative, abusive, and unfaithful. One night, I became bitter, angry, frustrated, and jealous to the point that I almost had violence with those girls. But the Lord was so gracious to me and good to me that that night, I happened to call Sister Debbie Davis. She answered her phone and witnessed to me. She has showed me how my ex truly didn't love me, even though he said he did by showing me 1 Corinthians 13 about how love is patient, love is kind, it does not dishonor others, is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love never fails. Now, I will never find anyone outside of self-defense. I'm very grateful on how Sister David Davis had, has been discipling me, as well as Sister Anya. Because of her trials in her life, she was an amazing blessing to me, an example of how the Lord has changed me. Uh, one day I was at the grocery store. There was a girl standing in, the, in her truck. She was on my way for me to park. Um, I honked at her for her to move, but she told me there were more spots. And, it's, and I reacted by apologizing instead of the old me saying, what is your problem, and started a drama. Then I realized the Lord had truly changed my stony heart for, one, for a flesh one. As I walked away, I started cr uh, crying and praising the Lord for changing me. Enter through a narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is easy, that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow, and for the way is hard, that leads to, li that leads to life, and there is only a few who find it. Matthew 7, 13. I praise the Lord so much for allowing me to find um, a, a way that I kept uh, kept all, all these years, I kept neglect, uh, neglect, ne neglecting um, every time someone tried to talk to me about Jesus Christ. Now, um, Christ is my life. I'm no longer my own. We were bought and redeemed by his precious blood that he shed on the cross. Uh, the least thing I can and want to do is to pick, pick up his cross and follow him for as long as I live. I praise God for bringing me to Cornerstone Baptist Church. I'm very grateful for my soul to be here and to belong to this amazing biblical church through the gospel of Jesus Christ that has changed my life. I love you all. Bless you.